Welcome to Work Beautifully, a podcast brought to you by Dialpad that discusses growth, learnings, and pitfalls to avoid in business. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to season three of Work Beautifully, a podcast brought to you by Dialpad, covering the latest in business communications and AI. I'm Grace Lau, Director of Growth Content here at Dialpad, and I'll be your host for this season. In episode two, we chatted with Simon Corson Oliver, Dialpad's Director of Machine Learning, about linguistics and why it's such an important consideration for companies that are using and building AI tools. You can catch that episode on Spotify. In this episode, we're joined by Dialpad Senior Manager of the ASR and Data Teams, Natalie Owen, to talk about another big topic, the ethical use of AI. Thanks so much for joining us today, Natalie. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, Do you want to start by introducing yourself to our audience and telling them a bit about your role here at Dialpad? For sure. Um, As you said, I'm Natalie Owen. I'm the Senior Manager of our uh, Speech Recognition and AI Data Teams. with the speech recognition team, I work on with them to guide the balance between making sure that we're delivering high quality speech recognition for various different business needs, uh, for different languages and dialect support, while also ensuring that the team has time for research and future planning, working on the next big thing in ASR. I'm also the head of our AI data teams, which uh, include analysis, annotation, and testing who work closely with the ASR team, as well as our natural language processing teams to ensure that they have access to the data that they need to develop models and also to work on research projects in helping our engineers find ways to improve their projects. Cool. And how did you get into the field of AI? Um, It was a bit of chance and a bit of um, being in the, the right place at the right time. Um, I've been in you know, the tech world for a long time now. I had worked my way through various different companies and, and industries in into kind of a more managerial role. And I started working with um, Talk IQ, who's a startup at the time, before they were purchased by Dialpad, um, when the team was really small and they had really great technical leadership and, and people who really knew what they were doing from, from that side of things. But they did need some support around um, more of the process and people management and how to really ship great products. As the team grew and I took on some more leadership uh, and definitely learned a lot um, about ASR and machine learning on the job while while I've been working with the team uh, and really just helping this this group of really kind of academically minded people take some really cool scientific research and and make sure that it was really useful to our business customers. Yeah, it's always cool seeing how broad the experience um, of folks who are on the AI team can be. Like we've got folks like I think twelve PhDs or something on the team that Etienne mentioned, and they're all in different kind of fields. So that's always really cool to see. Yeah, we've got a really great group of really smart people, and like you said, a lot of really diverse backgrounds. I think it really helps us to tackle problems from a lot of different perspectives. So speaking of tackling problems, let's get into a topic that there's been no shortage of discussion about. And this is something I've seen on on Reddit, on social media, almost everywhere people talk about AI. And it's about ethics and bias specifically. So humans are, we're, we're obviously biased. We all have our own specific sets of biases. So AI being built by us, imperfect humans, the question is like, is AI being built by humans who are inherently biased also inherently biased? Yeah, I think that AI systems aren't really inherently anything. It's it, like you said, it's a reflection of uh, the people and the data that is selected to build them. Um, so I think that mm, true. as humans, we can really work and and try our best to identify and be aware of um, our biases so that we can try and do what we can to mitigate them. So, you know, in how we choose the data and how we, even the types of problems that we decide to tackle, um, we can really, we can do a lot to uh, remove that bias, but we're probably never going to completely eliminate the bias in AI, just like we're not going to completely eliminate the bias uh, in humanity <laughs> as a whole. Like I said, being aware yeah. of, of our biases, we can minimize the damage that is done by systems um, 
by like I said, making sure that we focus on problems that are things that we can tackle and things that are the right things for a machine to do. It's interesting because I think in movies where we see AI being represented, which is probably where most people kind of get their ideas about AI from, like in a lot of movies, you, you see AI being like this being or like almost like a sentient being, like in like Free Guy or in Her, even in Alexa, I guess, and, and Siri. It's like AI is this being that's capable of responding and having a conversation and talking to you. And I think that maybe is where the ethics kind of rears its head a little more because, I mean, there's also lots of applications of AI, like like in transcription or, you know, sentiment analysis tools where the kind of ramifications of ethics don't come out as much. Would you say that's fair? That kind of perception of, of AI being sentient kind of invites more questions about ethics, whether or not it's ethical or not. Yeah, definitely. I think that people think that AI is a lot more sophisticated than it actually is. Uh, in reality, it is mm -hmm. a lot of um, simple pattern matching. <laughs> um, it's not uh, yeah. like it's it doesn't think in the same way a human thinks. And so I think that that does lead people to question can the machine think if we didn't teach it how to think properly, right? Uh, but really, it's it's not mm -hmm. it's not thinking. It's 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 matching patterns. It's it's coming up with complex ways of of, of applying things that it has seen in the past to to different solutions. And so I think that when we look at things like speech recognition, um, where we need to be careful around um, ethical use is in ensuring things that like how it is implemented doesn't hurt specific groups in meaningful way. That I think is interesting because that um, reminds me of those AI tools that are coming out now where they can help HR screen candidates. I don't know if that's like speech recognition per se, but it's an AI tool that, you know, if it's used for candidate screening for jobs, that has a pretty big ethical implication um, if it's not fair or um, unbiased, right? Yeah. And that's where like that kind of social screening is one of the areas that using AI can be very problematic. <laughs> um, we want to mm -hmm. make sure that because what we're going to do is we're going to pattern match, but what will pattern match is what has successfully worked in the past. But what we see in that data is a lot of bias. So you'll see things like, okay, well, mm -hmm. this person who went to this prestigious school has worked out well for us in the past. So then we're going to see a lot more candidates that also went to that prestigious school. And that's going to exclude people who didn't necessarily have the opportunity to attend a, a school like that. Um, so there can be a lot of just reinforcing existing biases when we uh, train a, mm -hmm. a, a machine learning model on existing data that does tend to be biased. Right. Does it follow then that the more diverse, I guess, the kind of samples that it trains off of for an AI, the better? Is that a pretty like generally accepted rule of thumb? That That's our general rule of thumb is, is we really want to, as much as possible, have our data that we train on be as representative of our actual user base as possible. It can mm -hmm. be really hard to get data like that, which is uh, why yeah. we don't see a lot of that in, in industry. But for the same reason that, you know, biases exist in the first place, like there are, you know, you're going to be able to find data sets of kind of a standard North American kind of California type accent. You're, you'll find a lot more data of that type than of, you know, non-native speakers or even people with more of a Southern US accent. Uh, and things like that. So we want to make sure that when we're choosing the data, when we're training a model, we try and make sure that we're as representative as possible of our actual users. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's like one of the hardest parts about building ethical AI is just finding that kind of representative sample size? Yes, definitely. I think that and especially if we're in a great place that we have access to a large swath of diverse data. A lot of people, especially, you know, as they're starting out or even when they're studying and things like that, their their access to data is a lot more restricted. You know, they're they're limited to what are kind of free things that they can find, whether that is, you know, kind of official data sets or, you know, finding data on, on the Internet through you know, people like to use sources like Reddit. But that obviously has its own biases and it's you know, so it's, much it's bias. a very particular <laughs> group of users yeah. that have a, a particular way of communicating and they have, you know, 
that's not going to be representative of North America as a whole or the world as a whole, right? It's it's really representative of Reddit users. So unless you're building an AI for Reddit users, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's and that's there's people use things like Wikipedia, anything that's like available on the internet um, that you can kind of easily you know crawl on on the web is, is an easy kind of access. It's not going to be the best quality. It's not usually going to be the best what you're building an AI to, to face. That's the other piece that that's, we found has been really beneficial is using data that's as similar as possible to the data to train a model that the um, machine is going to then experience when we're asking it to do its job. So, you know, using actual phone audio of the you know, correct quality with with the different dialects, with different you know background noise, all of those sorts of things that um, the model is going to experience once we kind of let it free in the wild. What does the audio quality, out of curiosity, have to do with like a sample being good or bad? Is it not just the unbiased nature of it? Is like the actual sound quality also play into it? Well, that's that's less about bias and more about the quality of. Um, of the experience that you'll be able to. So it, if you are training a model on low quality audio, but then it's being asked to interpret high quality audio, there's going to be a gap there. So mm -hmm. if we can get the audio that we train it on as close as possible to the audio that we're going to be asking it to interpret, then we can get the best results out of our model. Interesting. That's I didn't know that that factored into it as well. So being on our AI team um, with AI being such a big part of Dialpad's product, of course, um, it does the real-time transcription, it does the sentiment analysis. How does ethics kind of play into you and your team's day-to-day -day, um, as you approach that question? Um, it's a great question. We really have built it into our processes from the beginning. Um, we, Like I said, we have a really great team who are just really aware of how bias can affect their models. Um, but we've also created an internal committee around ethics in AI that we you know, get together on a, a regular basis to, uh, along with our legal team. And we provide guidance for the team on things to look out for. We've created you know, a general ethics guidelines that we want to follow as a company. And we also have um, created a checklist for our actual engineers to use when they're going through a project to, from the planning to the rollout to figure out, okay, what are the things that I, I should take a pause and think about and, and look at before I proceed to ensure that I'm doing my best job to mitigate bias in, in our models. It's really important to, before you build a model, think about how it could fail or how it could be used mm -hmm. poorly uh, before we build it so that we can do our best to mitigate it. And that's also part of why we even uh, structured our team the way we have in putting together our AI data team. Um, those uh, mm -hmm. analysts used to be kind of spread out across um, the ASR and NLP teams, but we decided to get them all together so that they could all really focus um, and have, we have this team of individuals that are really aware of things like those sampling protocols, like bias, different biases that can exist in the data, even how to handle our data in an ethical way so that we're not risking things like data breaches. Um, and then they, mm -hmm. can, they work together to guide our AI engineers who are building the models on how to you know, help them to evaluate how those models perform on different groups so that we can ensure that we're not releasing a model that, for example, always scores female agents more negatively than male agents, right? We really want to make sure that mm -hmm. we're being as fair as possible and doing as much as possible to, to mitigate those biases before we release a model. Mm. Cool. I don't know if you remember this, Natalie, but I think this was like a year or two ago. Have you heard of Ask Delphi? I believe I have heard of it. I, it's not 100% coming to mind what it was. It was like I, I think it was like an AI or a machine learning software, it claimed to be able to answer any ethical questions. <laughs> I thought it, I just remember it because like we we're talking about ethics and AI, but yeah. it's basically a piece of software. It says it can um, answer, that generates answers to any ethical question that people had. Yeah. I don't know if you remembered when that came out, but that was like a huge, I think AI plus ethics thing for, yeah. for a bit. I, I can imagine how that went. 
<laughs> I don't yeah, remember. No, it was like pretty particularly, but I think it was all I, over I can the imagine. place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and those those types of the problem with those types of systems is it it's trained on a set of data that was annotated by a set of users that have specific biases, whatever those happen to be. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it might have answered ethical questions the way that that specific data set would answer an ethical question. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that there, it was able to come up with some universal truth that humans could not come up with, right? I I think that it's funny to think that, yeah, uh, you can't take the humanity out of that decision, even if it's a machine making the decision, because the humanity persists mm-hmm. in that data. Oh, humanity persists. That that was <laughs> really, I think that's a really good title <laughs> for an AI episode. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, no, it's funny you mentioned that because I think going back to what you mentioned earlier about training on Reddit, I think Reddit's probably one of the worst possible sources of data you could train an AI <laughs> on. And actually, I think that's what Ask Delphi was trained on. It was from like yeah. one of the sub... I think it was from the Am I, am I the A-hole subreddit. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with that okay. one. Yeah. <laughs> that was a part yeah, of the training, which... <laughs> yeah. <it> may- <laughs> yeah, actually, that probably brings, makes a lot of sense. That, that brings to mind, actually, a, a story from like like a while ago in, in our... When we were training some of our early... Um, ASR models, when we had access to less data that was, you know, strict business conversations, we were more reliant on data sources that we purchased or were able to find in kind of the open source world. And one of the data sources yeah. was listed as uh, like meetings. Um, but what mm-hmm. the data when we actually and, and we put it into our, our model and we found actually that our model was really likely to um, transcribe words as swear words, even when when no swear words were said. And uh, one of the root (laughs) causes of that was that this data set that was marked as meetings was, I think it was actually, you know, something similar to like a, like um, gamer chat of some description where, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was people talking to each other, but it was not a business meeting. It it was, it was, uh, you know, people that were, more inclined to to use swear words and and say things that get angry at each other after they lose the a average. round. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, not happening on most people's business meetings. <laughs> no. Although, I mean, I've definitely heard on customer calls like people swearing and stuff. So, I don't know it's well, casual. And that's, if you have a casual relationship with your sales rep. <laughs> That's that actually brings up another fun story of like we actually had um, some issues when we were rolling out our um, Australia model because just in Australia it is much more common to swear, uh, and so that was something mm-hmm. that was we were we had to make sure that we were adapting our model to that specific group of people so that it was working as as best as it could for them right and so that you know the swearing didn't necessarily mean that there was negative sentiment going on. It was not because somebody was, um, was angry uh, or that they were you know, upset with somebody. It was just that they were more likely to yeah. swear. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I have some friends from Australia and that tracks, <laughs> that tracks a lot, <laughs> but you don't really think about, that's the funny thing about like language and AI and transcription and all that is like, you don't, it's funny that you don't pay attention to those patterns and in, in just cultural patterns or just language patterns until I guess you have to build an algorithm <laughs> off of it. And it's funny too, because I think people think about, even when you talk about accents, people think about, you know, the broad strokes of like Australia or North American, you know, American accents or uh, UK accents. But like, even within each of those, there are a lot, there's a lot of differentiation and a lot of different groups and subgroups and a lot of those people will even um, change the way that they speak depending on the context and who they're speaking to. So somebody with a really strong, say, Southern U.S. accent, when they're in a business context, might actually change their accent a bit in order to sound more 
you know, West Coast, because uh, yeah. that is perceived by people because of our biases as, you know, more professional or, or more intelligent. Yeah. Um, and code switching. It's obviously not true, but <laughs> it, it's something that, yeah. that people, um, they, they kind of mask in that way and, and will will change the way that they behave based on the context. And so it's not even like we can have, you know, just one model that for, you know, the Southern U S because, Hey, they might speak differently depending on context. And, and we need to make sure that we're able to support mm-hmm. all of those contexts. Have you heard about, um, UNESCO and their launch of the, I think they called it a global standard for AI ethics. I have not heard of that specifically, but I have heard of, um, the work that the uh, European union is doing on putting together some, uh, regulations around UI or AI. Yeah. I think, I don't know. I don't know if it's the same thing, but it was um, basically like they put together these guidelines or principles that um, are meant to guide the development of AI, I don't know, AI research and stuff like that. And I think it covered like a fair amount, like there's gender and ethnic bias, there were like privacy, like standards, um, mass surveillance a whole bunch of a whole bunch of things. I thought that was interesting because it seems like there was an attempt to like try to regulate somewhat the development of AI from from an ethical standpoint. Do, do you think that that's possible? I like to think it's possible because I think that AI, like like anything else, is, it's a tool and it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. Um, and I think that. If we allow bad people to do bad things with AI, then and they can make money by doing that, then they're probably going to do it. So by putting regulations in place around the types of things that um, companies can or cannot do, I think it's going to help to protect those marginalized groups. Um, I think you know the example that you brought up earlier of of things like a recruiting system. That's you know something that I would consider you know a high risk for um, an AI system, you're going to have to be really thoughtful about how you roll something like that out. And I think mm-hmm. the EU has categorized a few things as kind of unacceptable risk um, because they're, you know, things like actually being like manipulative or exploitative um, and causing harm to people using AI systems or using things like biometric identification in public spaces, specifically for law enforcement purposes. Like, the benefit that you get from those, it's they they've kind of decided outweighs the the risks to the individuals, and so I think that it's important that as a society we have those conversations and really think about those things because otherwise everybody's just going to kind of do what they can to 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 make money and 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 get ahead, and I think that exploit. people are going yeah. to exploit people, and and it's it's what we see. And how we kind of got to to where we are now, um, where you know, people in marginalized groups are going to be the people that are going to be more likely to be negatively affected by those types of systems. And I think that we should be, as a society, doing what we can to to help those people to have as close of an experience with the average other person, uh, as opposed to having a you know much more negative experience in in society, right? And so it's it's really important yeah. that we are really thoughtful and careful about how we apply AI uh, in in those Mm -hmm. higher risk situations um, so that we can do our best to to protect those marginalized groups. Yeah, for sure. And also have an ethics team on your AI team if you're building an AI tool, Um, which is, I don't know, I think think it's really special that you folks are like dedicated to AI. Like I've seen some of the content and stuff that you put out. So yeah, I'm really thankful to be able to be part of a team that does care about this. And it is something that we are able to you know, spend time thinking about and, and do our best to mitigate it. Uh, and it's, mm-hmm. it's nice to, to work on a team that cares. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I think that's a good spot to end off on this episode. Thanks, Natalie. It was really cool chatting with you today about ethics and AI. Definitely a huge topic and leaves me wary but optimistic for the future of AI. I think that's a good place to to be. I think that if we we need need to (laughs) continue to be thoughtful and vigilant, right? You know, it's 
if yeah, we if yeah. we're complacent about it, then uh, I think it likelier to end up in a bad place than if, if we at least put some thought and care into it. For sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us um, on Work Beautifully, a Dialpad podcast. Learn more about Dialpad's AI-powered unified communications and contact center platform at dialpad.com and find us on your favorite social channels at Dialpad. Stay tuned for the next episode where we'll be answering some Reddit questions about AI with Jonas from our AI team. Till then. Mm-hmm.